Today we're going to talk about chapter one, which is the economic problem. This chapter begins by talking about how economists think. In economics, we take reality and simplify it into models that show the key characteristics of an economic phenomenon. So the real world's really messy. We make models where we make certain assumptions to simplify things and get the underpinnings of what's going on. And one of the things we do is we assume rational behavior. So, you know, we assume people make logical choices. We know in reality that that's not always true, but we make that assumption to simplify the model and keep things tractable. Okay. Um, so we also seek objective ways to analyze how humans act in social settings. So like if you just think of a market, there's a lot of, you know, the things that can go on there. It can be quite complex. When we do our model of supply and demand, we make some simplifying assumptions about how buyers and sellers would behave. So in general, um, economics is a little different actually than many of the other courses that you learn because it's a little more abstract. Uh, it, we have a lot of what ifs rather than what is. And we, we make sort of models that simplify reality. But in doing that, we get a good framework to think about the complex behavior that we do actually in the real world. Okay, so let's start with the economic problem. So in any society where you have human beings living, we have, you know, we inevitably have to at least have food and shelter. So we need to produce at least food and shelter. In the modern economy, obviously, we produce thousands and or millions of different goods and services. Now, the economic problem is that we have scarce inputs. So the inputs to producing anything are natural resources. So you could think of water or any natural resource, land, we also need tools, capital, you know, we need some kind of way to uh, convert these things into output or services. And we need humans to actually be part of that process as well. So you could categorize the inputs to any production that a society uses into these three categories. And an economic system is what takes these things, you know, coordinates and all of the logistics and organizes these factors of production into outputs that we want and need. Now, the problem is, is that the stuff on the left is obviously limited. It's scarce. Okay. We don't have unlimited, uh, you know, capital resources, natural resources, or human resources, but our wants seem to be unlimited. So that's sort of the issue. If our economic resources or inputs were unlimited, then we wouldn't need to be studying economics. Now, an economic system is what we're going to talk about in a moment, but an economic system is the rules and, and behaviors of the people in the society uh, related to taking these inputs and making outputs. There are two extreme examples that we'll talk about, the market system, and then the other extreme example would be a command system like in uh, Cuba or North Korea or the former Soviet Union. And in that case, the government made all of the decisions. In a market system, we indirectly make the decisions through our purchasing behavior. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's the main economic problem. Obviously, we have scarce resources and our wants and needs are unlimited and, you know, it's a problem that the economic system has to solve. Some economic systems are better than others. So again, these are our inputs to production. So natural resources, again, are anything related to stuff that you can make stuff with from nature, and that includes land. When we talk about capital resources, we're talking about tools used to make goods and services, buildings, any you know anything like that, a plant, materials, real physical capital. This doesn't include financial capital. When you when somebody purchases a stock, that's just a transfer of ownership. Nothing was produced in that transaction. So things like that aren't included. However, the the services of a of a stockbroker or something like that would that service would be uh well that wouldn't be capital, but we would include that in, in say GDP, but we'll talk about that in the macro chop. But in in terms of capital resources, what we're talking about here are physical resources and then human resources were we're here talking about uh, labor effort, and there's a special kind of labor effort we call entrepreneurial 
ownership. And that relates to when uh, you have someone that's owning a firm and they're coordinating and managing and taking the risk to convert those scarce resources into output for sale. But these are the three main categories. We have stuff from the earth, tools, and you know, labor effort. So as I said earlier, economic models simplify reality. Um, in a lot of models, there's usually some sort of dependent variable, and then there's an independent variable. So a dependent variable would be something like uh, quantity demanded, and then the independent variables to that would be something like the price of the good or the income levels, uh, price of other goods, because all of those things will, uh, you know, changes in any of those things will result in changes in the quantity demanded of a good. And, you know, different variables have different relationships. So they could be either inverse or direct or negative and positive, same sort of idea. For example, a demand curve has a negative slope, so it has an inverse relationship. So there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. The higher the price, the lower the quantity, and then the other way around. Whereas the supply curve has a positive relationship, the higher prices are, the more firms would be willing to sell. So an important concept in economics is this Latin term, uh, ceritibus, uh, sorry, ceteris paribus. It just means holding other things constant. So when we look at the relationship, say, between the quantity demanded of a good and its price, we want to hold constant any of the other factors that could affect quantity demand. And basically, we're saying we we like to uh, isolate relationships and look at specific, you know, keep things simple and look at a specific relationship and hold other things constant so that it's not uh, confusing us and uh, we can get a, a better idea of what we're looking at. So it, this depends on the certain phenomenon that we're analyzing. Um, we won't get into this too much in the course, um, but this chapter talks briefly about utility maximization. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview. So utility is just a word for your satisfaction or, or happiness gained from consuming a good or service or, or any sort of uh, action. Um, again, we would assume consumers are rational and that they their decisions would be to maximize their own happiness or satisfaction uh, from consuming a good. And we also assume that people generally tend to act to maximize their own welfare. Of course, this isn't always true. Um, you know, it depends on, on the models we're looking at. In some models, maybe we'll make adjustments to this. But for this course, uh, you don't need to worry too much about. It. Now, a really important concept, and this relates a lot to what we talked about earlier uh, about the econ you know the scarce resources and the economic system uh, the concept is called opportunity cost and this is defined as the utility of the best foregone alternative so we whenever we make a decision to use our scarce resources there's an opportunity cost associated with that it's what we could have been doing you know what else we could have done with those scarce resources. Even your time, if you have a free lunch, if you're offered a free lunch and you go and have a, a free lunch, you know the person pays for it, there's still an opportunity cost because your time is scarce and your opportunity cost of that free lunch is whatever else you could have done in that time. You're never gonna get that time back. So there's always an opportunity cost. So whenever we think about um, making any kind of a choice to use our scarce resources, we give up something. There's an opportunity cost associated with that. So there's a, a trade-off. So because of our resources, uh, you know, again, those uh, inputs to production that we talked about, they're scarce. So because they're scarce, that forces us to make choices. And when we make choices, that involves opportunity costs. Uh, if the government decides to spend money building uh, an Olympic stadium for the Olympics, well, the opportunity cost is that money could have been spent on maybe better education or a, a new hospital. Okay, because, you know, the resources that are used to build that stadium are, are scarce. And once you use them to build a stadium, then you can't, you know, make anything else with those resources. Does that make sense? So any decision regarding the use of resources involves benefits, obviously. So if we use our scarce resources, our, our labor, land, and capital to build a stadium for the Olympic Games, we get benefits. You know, we now, we now have a nice stadium and the benefits of hosting the Olympics, for example, and all that. Uh, 
we get, but we have to give up something and the, it's the opportunity cost. Those scarce resources could have been used for something else like hospital. If we already have really good hospitals, then maybe the opportunity cost isn't too high in that, but there's always going to be some opportunity cost. So you kind of want to make decisions where you're minimizing your opportunity. So let's see if you were paying attention. So we have a question here. It says, which of the following is the opportunity cost of attending college? So I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about it. Yeah, almost. So there's a lot of letter B's coming in. Uh, you're right. Um, so money spent on clothing, well, that's not necessarily an opportunity cost of attending college because you probably would have bought clothing anyways, right? Unless you were, say, going to a school that had a uniform and you had to buy a uniform, then the cost of that uniform, you know, would be an opportunity cost of attending college because that you, if you did go to college, you wouldn't have bought that uniform. But luckily, we don't have to wear uniforms to school. Um, and you're correct with B, yes, uh, foregone income um, from working full time would be something you give up to to attend college but of course you're assuming that the benefits of attending college are going to outweigh the amount of income that you lost while working full-time so especially if you don't have any education and you're getting education you know you the amount you're going to get paid isn't going to be that much so you're not giving up all that much because when you have a education and then you start getting you know really good specific experience your income will be higher and you know that will be for the rest of your life and that will more than outweigh the a little bit of amount of money you lost work full-time at a minimum wage job instead of going to school right um so the money spent on tuition and books well uh yes because if you didn't go to school you wouldn't have purchased those so these are an opportunity cost again these you know these are things that you think the benefits would outweigh in the long run what about money spent on your smartphone so no uh because you likely would have had a cell phone a smartphone anyways unless you would have only bought a smartphone for going to school which i wouldn't believe then it's not going to be an opportunity cost and then what about your satisfaction or you know any of the positive benefits from learning while you're in school is that an opportunity cost no, you're right. It's that's actually the benefit, not cost. Okay, so the next concept we're going to talk about is the production possibilities curve. This item here actually nicely summarizes these concepts that we just learned. So it will summarize scarcity, choices, and opportunity cost. So it's, a, again, a very simple model, and it, it illustrates those important concepts that we just talked about. There's three assumptions based on this simple production possibility model. Um, for simplicity, we're just thinking about uh, two products. So if we assume there's some economy uh, and they only produce two products, uh, then it keeps it simple so we can draw it on a two-dimensional diagram. Of course, the ideas are generalizable to any number of goods, but it gives us a good framework to think about things in. And in this model, we have that resource quantity and available technology are fixed. So it's kind of a static model. So we're just looking at it at a specific point in time. And the other assumption is that all resources are employed to their fullest path. That would be if we're on the boundary. So this production possibility curve all it does is simply show the range of possible output combinations or choices for an economy. And as I said, it highlights scarcity of resources. And, it, and let me just go back there. It has a concave shape, which reflects the law of increasing opportunity cost. And I'll uh, highlight that in a moment, explain it in a moment. So let's look at a diagram of one of these things. So first, we have a production possibility schedule. Now, a, when it's as, when, when we use the word schedule, we're just talking about the data being in a table. And if we put this data on a, if we plot this data, then this would be the production possibilities curve. Okay, so here this outlines the two, you know, the production possibilities for a hypothetical economy that has hamburgers and computers. Not the best example, I didn't make it, but we'll go with it. So what we're saying here is that if all of the the scarce resources in this economy were dedicated toward making hamburgers, then they would be able to produce a thousand hamburgers. Okay, and obviously if all their resources are dedicated to hamburgers, they're not going to be producing any computer. Now, 
if they want to make one computer, then they have to give up the resources associated with a hundred hamburgers. And we can keep going. And then at the bottom here, if they put all of their resources into making computers, they'd only be able to make three. And then obviously, if they're putting all their resources into computers, they wouldn't be hamburgers. So let's put this on a diagram. So let's plot these points. So point A is going to be right here, right? It's going to be where we have a thousand hamburgers and zero computers. Point B is going to be here. Point C is going to be here. And point D is going to be here so we're just plotting these now you'll notice that this isn't a line it has this uh, concave to the origin shape now let's talk about why we would draw it like that so again we're choosing to draw this a certain way not we're not just doing this randomly we have a reason for that um, the reason is is that we tend to believe in reality in most cases that the resources or you know the scarce resources so land capital uh you know labor those things aren't always equally suited to produce either of the goods in an economy okay so let's say we start here so we're here we have a hundred sorry a thousand hamburgers now if we want to make one computer we have to give up 100 hamburger so here this is this vertical distance is illustrating the opportunity cost so the opportunity cost of one computer is a hundred hamburger okay now we also we're also assuming we're going to be efficient so uh, that was one of the assumptions for this thing and so if we're going to make a hundred uh, a one computer we're going to take resources away from hamburger production that are going to be the of least cost we're not going to take people who are really good at hamburger production and have them make computers we're going to take people who maybe are more inclined to be better at computers and not as good as hamburgers so in that case we're not giving up that much we're giving up a bit but we're not giving up that much when we go to point b but as we move forward to the right and make more computers we're going to have to give up more because we're going to have to take resources that are good in hamburger production and have them being used in computer production okay and so the opportunity cost now for another computer is going to be 300 so the opportunity cost here is 100 now the opportunity cost is going to be um let me just sorry i'll go back um now the opportunity cost is going to be 300 and now if we want to make the third computer we have to give up 600 hamburger so this is the law of op increasing opportunity costs it's just the assumption that resources aren't equally suitable in either sector so we're going to take away the least suitable ones at first and so our opportunity costs are going to be low at first but then they're going to start getting it's going to start getting higher and higher because we're going to have to take away resources that are really good and suitable for this sector and have them in the other sector. Okay, so uh, someone's asking why 100 hamburgers for one computer is not clear. So again, if we go from point A to point B, at point A, we have a thousand hamburgers, zero computer. And again, this is showing us our production possibilities. Okay, so this is telling us that if we want to make one computer, we have to give up 100 hamburger okay and if we want to make another computer we have to give up 300 if we want to make another computer we have to give up 600 so another uh thing to point out here is any points in in the boundary here below the boundary would be inefficient so this economy can produce this point you know it could produce one computer and maybe roughly 500 hamburgers uh, but it could also but you know it could also produce one computer and 900 hamburgers. so any points below here are inefficient so if we were thinking of an economy in a recession um, we would be inside of our production possibilities curve because we would not you know in a recession we're not utilizing all of our labor resource people are unemployed and a point obviously like F is unattainable the given the resources in this economy they cannot produce two computers and you know 900 hamburger it's not possible given their scarce resources so points such as F would be unobtainable so let, we'll just go over that again so if we look at point B and then point C 
To get that extra computer, we have to give up 300 hamburgers. And so this is the opportunity cost of one computer. So again, the production possibility curves illustrates opportunity cost. It also illustrates scarcity because we can't get points above here. And clearly it indicates choices, right? We have choices. If you know we choose to go from point A to B, we have to give up 100 hamburgers. From B to C, we saw it was 300. And from C to D, we saw that it was 600. Okay, and just to reinforce it, if the opportunity costs are increasing like this, then it's because of the law of increasing opportunity costs, which just is an assumption. We're just saying, you know, we're gonna represent this as a concave curve to the origin. And when we do that, it's because we believe that resources aren't equally suited to either sect. And that's why it would look like this. If we drew a linear production possibilities curve, then we are making the assumption that the resources are equally suitable in each good. So you're not going to have, you know, the opportunity cost that would be constant throughout. So there might be certain situations where that's true. Uh, maybe if we're thinking of a deserted island and the only two good are coconuts and, and bananas and you know each person is equally uh, capable or skilled in collecting either of those two goods and we might see a linear production possible but more realistically you know there would be a curve and so you know it's just a nice simple little model that gives us a framework to think about the economic problem in gives us a, a framework to think about scarcity opportunity cost and choices so we have a question what if the two production units are perfectly matched in terms of required reason so that that's basically what i was saying you know if they the resources were equally suited in producing either of the two goods then this would be linear okay let's talk about economic growth so we can illustrate economic growth with the production possibilities curve as well so what can you what do you think economic growth if I wanted to represent economic growth what would I do to the production possibilities curve okay so let's let's talk about a contraction so economic growth is when the production possibility curve shifts outwards so if there but it depends right if it could be a parallel shift it could rotate on the bottom it could rotate on the left um if there is some say new improvement in technology that is equally useful in either of the two sectors then we would represent that with a parallel shift in the production possibilities curve if you think just abstractly, think of what the production possibilities curve for Canada would have looked like 200 years ago, and then think about what it would look like now. Obviously, it's shifted a lot to the right since then because of technology. Back in the day, we used to have to have, you know, half of our population working in agriculture just to put food on the table and they're, you know, and people work long hours, sometimes 12, 16 hours a day. Uh, nowadays, there's less than 3% of the population working in agriculture and we have obesity problems. We have more food than we know what to do with. That's all because of uh, technology. And so with this simple model, we would be representing changes like that with uh, shifts outwards in the production possibility curve. Okay, so economic growth occurs when uh, we have some kind of a productivity increase that gives us the ability to produce more goods and services given the scarce resources that we have. Economic contraction is just the opposite. So we would just shift that inwards. So obviously uh, the COVID-19 is a good example of that. It wasn't because of any problems with the economy being broken or anything. It's because, you know, the government decided that in order to prevent the spread of the disease to shut everything down. Um, so actually that so sorry i should be more clear on that um our economy did contract because of that but our production possibilities in that sense did not change we're just at a point within the production possibilities curve an inefficient point because we have resources that aren't being utilized um but if we were to think about actually shifting the production possibility curves inward that would be something different that would be something like a war or natural disaster that say destroyed a lot of the uh you know it, it could destroy people it could destroy uh infrastructure plants and that sort of thing and so then given all of that say destruction then the 
production possibilities that we have would have diminished and that's when we would shift it inwards okay so you know if something happens that makes productivity increase equally in both sectors then we shift it out to the right if something if there is a technological improvement that increases productivity in computer production only then we would just wrote this would stay here but we would rotate this out it would rotating out to the to the left and obviously if there's some kind of a natural disaster disease famine or something like that that destroys uh, our scarce resources that we use to produce stuff like capital, uh, you know, natural resources or people, then that's a shift inwards. Um, so someone has a question, uh, steeper the curve, more the contraction. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, I mean, we're just, you know, the, the worse the disaster, the more this would shift in. So, you know, again, what we're doing here is we're just saying, how would we represent something like a natural disaster or some type of event that destroys some of our scarce resources that we use to produce goods and services? Well, we would represent that with our simple model with a shift inwards of this production possibilities curve okay so that's all that's all we're saying uh, so a recession would actually not be a shift in this curve it would be where we're operating at a point below the boundary right these are our production possibilities that um, occur if we're being efficient and using all of our resources so a point like this means that we're not using some of our reasons in the, in the case of a recession usually we're not you know we have people that are unemployed so we're not using their labor and so there it's an it's any so someone's asking about the COVID-19 and the recession so yes that's correct so with the COVID-19 um, it's the similar we would represent that by having a point below our production possibility curve right because Nothing's really broke. Like we didn't lose anything in terms of our ability to produce goods and services. We still have talented, skilled labor. We still have our factories. We still have our capital. We still have land. We still have natural resources. All that's still there. We're just not, you know, using it all. We're at a point below our production possibilities. That's the same thing with the recession. You know, over the recession. Um, well, th this would this is a similar thing. Like the COVID nineteen has caused a recession. A recession is meaning that we are producing less goods and services, uh, you know, that the amount that we're producing, our economic activity has fallen. So they're the, pretty much the same thing. They're, but usually a recession is caused by something much different. Usually there's some kind of a, a, a bubble, a financial crisis. So usually there's something maybe kind of broken. Uh, or, you know, there's uh, some kind of uh, situation that people are overextending themselves. People have borrowed too much, like the, the Great Depression, you you know, in that case, a lot of people had borrowed money to invest in the stock market because they kept thinking it would go up. So a lot of the wealth is based on borrowed money. And so then as soon as something went wrong, everyone had to sell and then the whole thing collapsed. But uh, this is a bit different than that. This is sort of the government forcibly stopping production to avoid the disease from spreading. But the how we would represent that in this model would be exactly the, the same. So someone said, um, uh, but also, uh, uh, so are you guys having trouble hearing me or? All right. So anyways, I'll, I'll go on. Um, so that's the idea. So we have a little simple model that illustrates these concepts. Again, you know, you can, it's just a nice framework to think about things in. You could think about, you don't have to think about a particular image. You could think of thousands of goods. There's going to be something that's moving outwards or inwards. It's, you know, but this just gives you a nice framework to think about uh, the big picture economy. So let's do a quick question here. So we have a situation where we have an island castaway who spends eight hours each day acquiring two items, coconuts and fit and this is the castaways production possibility schedule so we're assuming here that if this person 
put all of their effort in the day to collecting coconuts, they would be able to get 24 and then obviously zero fish because they're not trying to catch any fish. On the other extreme, if they put all of their effort into catching fish, they would be able to catch three fish. And then there's these two, you know, there's different combinations in between. So the question here says, from a starting point of production shown by scenario A, what is the castaway's opportunity cost catching the first fish? So can anyone answer that? Yeah, you can type it in your chat. Yeah, I see a lot of fours. That's correct. So if this person decides, makes the decision to use his scarce time, his labor effort to catch one fish, then he will have to give up four coconuts. Okay. How much would he have to give up going from scenario B to C? Yep. Eight. And then if he decides that, you know, if he's currently at point C collecting 12 coconuts and two fish and decides that he just wants fish, how much coconuts would he have to give up? 12. And so we can see the law of increasing opportunity cost is present here. So we're basically saying this person, you know, isn't as good at fishing as they are uh, collecting coconuts. If he was equally productive in either one of these two, then we would have a linear uh, production possibilities. And so that's the answer to question B. It's saying, do these results conform to the law of opportunity cost? Yes. We can see that the opportunity cost of fish increases as we increase the number of fish. So if we drew this, plotted this out, what shape would it have? Would it be linear or would it be concave to the origin? Yes, that's right. So all we're asking here is what would this production possibilities curve look like? Well, since we just confirmed that the law of opportunity cost uh, of increasing opportunity cost is present, then it must have that concave shape. If it was a line that would assume that the opportunity cost are constant and so every time they catch a fish they'd be giving up the same amount of coconuts but that's not how this is. that's not the easy so oh yes we and we could redo this uh the other way around so if we were to go from uh zero coconuts and then you know we were thinking about producing one coconut how much fish we would have to give up you would get a similar result where the opportunity cost would be increasing but you'd have to redo the example to to do that because we're just given the information now f as we go up by one increments for fish. If we go up by, we would need the data for going up one increments of coconuts or something where these, the distance between these two numbers are the same. So if we had like uh, 10, 20, and 30, we, and then, but we would have to work with fractions of fish fishes there. So that wouldn't be as convenient. But yes, it, it would work the, the other. And what assumptions must be met for the castaway to operate on his production possibility? Possibilities curve? Well, the assumptions are that, well, there's a lot of assumptions. We're, so we're assuming obviously there's just two goods produced, and we assume that the quantity of the castaway's resources and the technology he uses are fixed. Otherwise, you know, if they change, then we would be shifting the production possibility curve. So we'd have a new one. And we're also assuming his resources are employed to their full capacity. So here, the only resources are, you know, the coconuts and fish and the labor effort that the person uses. If, for example, this person maybe took a day off and foregone cons some consumption that day to build a, a, a fishing rod or a fishing net, they might, so that would be an example of um, saving and then using savings in the sense that you're foregoing consumption and then producing a capital good like a fishing net, then you would be able to catch more fish. So in that case, we would have a, a, a shift in the production possibilities curve and it would actually be a it would just rotate. It wouldn't shift parallel. It would just rotate be uh, along the bottom where fish is because now he would be able to catch more fish for any given unit. What happens to the castaway's production possibilities curve if he works for 12 hours instead of eight each day? So how would we represent that? So clearly we would represent, that's as almost as if we have a new uh, scarce resource. So for whatever, maybe he's healthier now or something like that and is able to 
uh, spend more time per day, well, then obviously it would be a parallel shift. Yeah, you would just, mo- yeah, you would just, uh, well, I don't know about doubling everything. We don't know exactly. Uh, we just know he has more time, and with more time, he should be able to collect more coconuts and fish. We don't know exactly how much, but we know it would there would be some kind of a, uh, if we assume that the time, you know, if we assume that, that those extra hours will be equally productive in either of these two, then we would just have it shift parallel. And if he were less then it's a shift in and what happens to the castaways production possibility curve if he manages to make a fishing rod which he then uses successfully to catch fish so that would be let me use the annotation tool here then we would have something like this this would be fish this is coconuts and so if he has a fishing rod and he puts all of his effort into collecting coconuts, he's still going to be able to get the same amount of coconuts, right? So this isn't going to change, but he's going to be able to catch more fish. So it would be, you know, something like this. It would rotate over to the right. I apologize, I'm not the best drawer with this this tool, and it's not giving me an option to change the color either. So anyways, I think you, you get the, the point. Um, the, uh, yes, that's a good question. The opportunity costs would be affected because because you he, he, it's easier for this person to catch fish now so he wouldn't have to give up as much coconuts when he does go to catch fish right so if say for example with the fishing rod he can go out for one hour and collect 10 fish well then you know that's pretty impressive so then well, then for one unit of fish he's not gonna have to give up as much coconut so yes that would uh reduce the opportunity it's a good question okay so let's move on here okay so now we're going to talk about the three basic economic questions and all of this stuff is related suppose our class was stranded on a deserted island right as a group we're gonna have to answer three basic economic questions the first question is what to produce so of course if we're stranded on an island we're probably going to decide on food and shelter then we need to also decide how we're going to produce it right we need to know uh what wood we're going to use you know this is where we would be thinking too about who has certain skills among us if someone in our class was very good at gardening or something like that then we'd probably want them to be uh, producing food if someone has skills in carpentry then they would want to you know we'd want to have them making a uh, shelter and then now let's suppose we're successful at doing that we we have all kinds of different huts we have lots of food that we've grown or gathered the other question is how do we divide that up should the people who worked harder get more? Should people who have nice haircuts get, you know, how do you make that that decision? And, you know, essentially we're asking here how the economic pie is divided. So any economy, any society actually with people on it has to answer these questions, right? Now, it, you know, there's different variations in how these questions can be answered. Uh, so an economic system is actually what would answer these questions now there's we're going to look at three economic systems there's uh the traditional economic system so this sort of focuses on long time ago in history so we're talking here about maybe isolated communities or something like that where you know you can think of the 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 son would do the occupation of the father the the daughter would do the occupation of the mother that sort of thing um that's not too much prevalent anymore. The other big one is a market economy. And so in a market economy, we have a consumer center. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but we, we uh, one market system, one economic system is a market system. And then the other one would be a command system. So a market system is basically decentralized. People, th- there's some basic property rights. So people, you know, there's legal institutions to protect people from having their their uh, anything they own from being stolen. So there, and then people just voluntarily trade with each other. So if a firm uh, decides to open up and use our scarce resources to produce something we don't want or need, then in a market system, they'll just go out of business and that will stop. Uh, in a command economy, we th- this is a much different system. So it's instead of being decentralized like a market system, it's it's top down. It's more of a top down approach where the government 
actually explicitly outlines an economic plan. So as you can see, the each of these different economic systems will answer those three uh, questions. Oh, that's a good point. Someone just mentioned like a, a, a maybe an Amish community. Yeah, that's a good point. That would maybe be something like a, a, a traditional economy from my, un, from my understanding. I'm not sure there might be little elements of market within, but I think that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, example. Um, so let's talk about that. So a traditional economy, how does it answer these questions? So, you know, basically there's habits and customs that would be involved here. So, you know, the how to produce would be the way it's always been done. Um, you know, maybe children work the same jobs their parents have. Uh, back in traditional economies, it was, you know, the technology was so low that most of the production was, you know, people would work most of the day just to put food on the table, right? So that, that was primarily all, you know, their the occupations were simple, hunter, maybe there was someone that could make weapons. Uh, you know, it, it's just a very simple uh, economy. Um, so, yeah, so that that would be a traditional economy. Um, more interesting would be the market system. So and this is sort of what we're used to. So in a market system, uh, you have, you know, a basic set of arrangements um, like property rights, a, a legal system that protects property rights is one of the, the key essentials. And because without that, no one would produce anything if it could just get stolen or you, you wouldn't have any rights to that property, right? So you need uh, uh, property rights. And then you just have voluntary uh, buying and selling, but, you know, mutually benefit people just engaging in voluntary trade okay um so the individuals are free to pursue their own self-interest and uh you know the, the main that's the main key thing here it's just voluntary trade you have simple property rights set up and this is also sometimes referred to as capitalism so here the government would be minimal that of course i'm sort of talking here about the purest form of a market system and a, the purest form of a market system there would be only government involved in so far as they provide political um, and legal institutions to uh, that would be necessary to have the market be successfully operated. Um, so how would these three questions be answered in a market system? So I'm actually just going to I'll go back for a sec, but let's think about how the, the three questions would be answered here. So what to produce? Well, what to produce um, is answered indirectly through our purchasing decisions, right? If someone makes something and no one wants it, they're not going to be making it anymore because they won't make any profit. Uh, so that's how the what to produce gets produced. So it's very linked to what the people in the society want. What the people want will be what is produced. Now, how to produce? Well, in a market system, the firms themselves will figure that out. And there's going to be a an incentive for them to not waste scarce resources because they won't make profit, right? So there's a, an incentive here to be efficient and to produce things in, you know, the most cost-effective way. And then the for whom question is a little more tricky to answer. How do the income, so our share of the economic pie, get determined? Well, generally, we could say the, the, the supply and demand for our skills, but there's lots of exceptions to that. You know, some people make a million a year, some people make 20,000 a year. For the most part, a lot of it is depending on what skills they have and how if you have a very, you know, rare skill and there's a lot of demand for it, you know, maybe like a professional sports player, then you can make a lot of money. But, you know, so it, it's a it's much more it's a little bit uh you know, there's a lot of exceptions. There's not a hard and fast rule for that. But generally, we can think of the supply and demand for uh, your particular skills. Because in a market system, there's not only the goods market, there's the, the factor market or the, you know, the, the labor market, if we're thinking of uh, humans, right? And work, we trade our... our um, labor for a wage so the high you know the the more scarce our skill and the higher the demand for it the more we will get rewarded generally but there are still some people who have lots of money that maybe don't have the most you know there, there's lots of exceptions to that um, there, there are things like unions which are non-market activities which will 
which can result in higher wages despite uh, the supply and demand uh, issue. Um, in a mar so this this uh, figure here just shows you a basic overview of a market system. In a market system, we have the factor or resource markets. In this market, this is where households trade their, you know, so households own their labor, household, you know, humans own the factors of production. So humans own their labor, humans own capital, humans own land, etc. They trade that for income from businesses. So the households, for example, will provide the business with labor and in return, the business will provide them with wages. Okay, that's the resource market in the product market. Businesses will produce products in return for money consumer spending. So that this is just a you know, brief overview. We'll uh, get into this a little more when we go into the macroeconomics part of the course. So some of the benefits of a market economy are consumer sovereignty, you know, as I said, the decision of what to produce is ultimately decided indirectly by households through their purchasing behavior. You could think of uh, your decision to spend your money as sort of like a vote. So when, you know, if a lot of people want to buy something, that's a lot of votes to have that product still be offered for sale. And the huge, the biggest benefit, uh, probably the reason, you know, if you look at human history, the only market system that's been able to give us a very high you know a lot of people a very high standard of living is the market system and likely this is because it has a built-in mechanism that ensures efficiency it ensures that our scarce resources are not wasted and it also promotes innovation so the two actually the two key things are profit and competition now if we look at a command system we'll see in a command system in a moment these two things aren't present and we we see that the standard of living in those systems likely as a result are very low. Now, there are a lot of good things about a market economy. You know, it, it is like this little engine that just creates wealth, but you know, there's obviously a lot of drawback. There's an unequal income distribution, uh, pollution and things like that can become a problem. There's no profit in cleaning up a pollution or, or environmental damage that you did. Uh, it can be instable at times. In a command economy, the government plans the economy. Economy, right so it doesn't plan for unemployment so there's no unemployment unless the government plans for there to be unemployment in a market system there's no top-down planning so you end up you can end up with instability recessions and unemployment um, there's lots of other things like uh, unfair competitive practices mistreatment of employees uh, again you have this sort of machine that just cares about making profit so you know it's there's there's uh, things that can happen that are not good that will be a consequence of them just caring about profit. So there's obviously a large role for government in a market economy if we believe as a society we don't want some of these things. And the government obviously tries to reduce instability in the business cycle as much as they can. We've seen this in the financial crisis and now with this COVID-19, immediately the governments in most countries increase government spending and they also uh, do the appropriate monetary policy to stimulate the economy. So they try and stimulate the economy in recessions. And if the economy's uh, maybe getting overheated and inflation is becoming a concern, they'll try to slow down the economy. So there's a lot of, you know, government involvement in our economy. So there's not really any pure market economies. There's always usually uh, quite a bit of government involvement, more so in some countries than others, but still we're more of a, a, a mixed economy economy as well. Um, so the, the majority of the production of goods and services, uh, maybe something like 70% is done in, in, in the private sector, private market, but still, you know, education, healthcare, uh, military, all of those things, that is sort of a command system that's all directed by and planned by the government. So a command system is essentially you have total control from the government. It's sort of a top-down 
system. The government comes up with a central plan and directs how all economic resources will be used. So in terms of our three questions, they explicitly answer these questions. They say exactly what will be produced. They say exactly how it will be produced. And they exa explicitly say how it will be divided up. So in many of the countries like, you know, Cuba, North Korea, or the former Soviet Union, East Germany, um, you know, there's probably some exceptions, but generally the idea was that the people were to get paid somewhat equally. Okay, so it, you know, it was this sort of communist idea. And the government decided exactly what would be produced and how it will be produced. In fact, all of the means of production were owned by the government in, in these types of systems. So one of the benefits of this type of system is that, you know, you have direct control over the income distribution and the allocation of capital goods. And, you know, that could, if you wanted to promote economic development, if you, if the government decided it wants to have a really good um, bicycle sector, then it could just make that decision. The decision is very uh, direct and easy to do. And in this type of system, you don't have business cycles because you're not going to plan for them, right? Everything's planned. So you're not going to plan for unemployment, plan for business cycles. So it can be stable. Now there's major drawbacks. Now the problem is if you're paying everyone the same thing, but not everyone is actually equal. Not everyone has the same preferences. So there's issues there. And if you're, everyone's paid this, if there's no incentive to work hard that, you know, there's all kinds of misplaced incentives in this type of system, which results in a lot of inefficiency. Um, you know, there's not much economic freedom. The, I, you know, the big issue is, is that in a command economy, there's no profit motive. So if the the government could decide to make some strange thing like polka dot yellow pants because some bureaucrat in the government decides that people will like them and then they will get made. And so our scarce resources will be used to make those even though nobody wants them. And that could go on for a very, very long time. But and then you know that but in a market system that would stop immediately because the no one would buy them. You know, our votes as a consumer would be zero and whoever's doing that, wasting our scarce resources will stop because they're not going to make a profit. It's a built-in mechanism. Uh, but in a command system, you don't have that. So there was many examples of very, like, how do you, if you, you need to have an incentive, if, if, you know, so these people were guaranteed jobs. So there, there's just no incentive to, to work hard. The quality of the products were apparently terrible because you have to buy from them. It doesn't matter if they do a good job or not, because you have to buy from the government store. So there's all kinds of issues with this. Um, and another big thing is how do you know you know maybe this would work okay with a, an economy of a hundred people but how do you know what millions of people want you know try think about sitting down and writing up what everyone wants that's not you know and then not only it's it's not only not very difficult to do it's also very inefficient too because you have all of these people hired so all of those labor resources being wasted on trying to come up with a plan of what everyone wants and then we know in a market system you don't need to do that it'll just things will figure themselves out so just in terms of a summary so a command system is top down the government explicitly answers these questions and it scores very poorly on efficiency uh, because it mainly of misplaced incentives in a market system there's no central economic plan it's decentralized bottom up Producers are privately owned, and the consumers sort of you know answer the these questions indirectly. Well, the 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 what to produce is answered indirectly through sort of our votes as a consumer. Uh, the how to produce is determined by the private firms, and they have an incentive to do it in an efficient way. And the labor market generally determines how the economic pie is split up. And one you know the negative issue of a market system is this is an equally split up and there's many you know in many especially like the u.s there the inequality is very high and so in terms of efficiency it scores very strong and that's because of the competition and profit motive another thing just to point out even in a pure market system if you had a you know as pure as you can get of a market system you could have the strongest firms survive and then you end up with a bunch of monopolies and no competition and that wouldn't be a good thing maybe it might be better than a command system i'm not sure but in that 
that case, you're not going to have competition. And so then you can, you know, these, these companies can take a, can uh, take advantage of consumers, uh, you know, take it, you know, use their market power in not so good of a way. So that's why it's important to have competition. And in most countries, there's a, a government agency that is responsible for trying to promote competition. In Canada, it's the Competition Bureau. So if companies have a, you know, get too, too big or too strong, and it looks like they may be abusing their market power, they'll, they'll get involved. Uh, for example, if two of the large banks want to merge with each other, they're not allowed to do that. They need to get approval from the uh, <clears throat> competition bureau because it could uh, un unduly uh, reduce competition if they were to merge. Um, so most economies, as I said, are mixed economies um, because there's a you know at least there there's usually a sizable government sector. There's no examples that I know of of a pure market economy. Um, so this is just a, a sort of a range. So we have traditional economy, market economy, and command economy. So uh, North Korea. I'm not sure why Cuba isn't here. Cuba would be here. They're very close to being, you know, and if you've been to Cuba on vacation, you can clearly see um, it's there. It's quite different than here. You can see the, the, the command economy in action. There has been some minor um, loosenings and moved a little bit. There's some smaller market uh, advances going on there, but it's still quite uh, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a very con conical idea of what a mar uh, command economy would look like. And then you have, you know, United States, Canada would be over here. We're, we're not a pure market economy. There's still a lot of government role of government. But for, you know, for the most part, consumer goods, food and things like that, generally it's all privatized. Um, and then, you know, Sweden maybe would be more over to the right. They have a little more government involvement. They have higher taxes, that sort of thing. So, you know, they're a little more, I guess you could say, socialist than maybe Canada, or the United States. And then you have this is mentioning uh, India and China as being maybe some elements still of traditional. Um, these countries are growing extremely fast. Uh, so I'm not sure how these might be more up, up towards top now uh, and probably will be at some point, uh, you know, in, in the future. So um, economic goals. So there, you know, there's if you're thinking of uh, what are some important goals that the economy should have, efficiency is obviously important because it directly translates to a higher standard of living. Income inequality could be another goal, depending on the country. Some countries, like you know, a lot of people in the U.S. don't mind having high inequality. Uh, Scandinavian countries would be more bothered by that. Um, price stability is important. We'll learn about that later in the course. Uh, we'd like to have as many people working as possible. Um, a viable balance of payments that, yeah, we'll talk more about that later in the course. Economic growth, of course, is very important. Uh, this translates into higher standard of living. And we like to do all of these things and, you know, still have, uh, still be friendly to the environment. Uh, there are obviously some goals that are complementary and some that are conflicting. Uh, an example where we have a complementary uh, complementary goals is between full employment. You know, if we want full employment, then and we also want economic growth. Well, they go hand in hand. Um, but if we want price stability and, and full employment, uh, that there could be issues there in some some cases because maybe in order to you know if you stimulate the economy too much, you could end up causing inflation. Uh, again, we'll talk more about inflation in, in the macro section, of course. So let's just finish up with some multiple choice questions so which of the following is not considered to be an advantage of the market type of economic system okay anyone yeah uh, e. So the answer here is E. Its economic benefits are spread quite evenly among its people. We know that that's not true. Uh, so one of the uh, negative aspects of a market economy is that it uh, can produce high levels of inequality. A company's decision to introduce a new green car that is designed to appeal to consumers who are concerned about the environment. That's an example of, don't get tricked here. So I'll give you a hint. The answer is not C. Yeah, the answer is A. So the what to produce decision is, relates to 
it, how should we be using our scarce resources to produce goods? And so, like, what should we be producing with our scarce resources? And so here, because there's a lot of consumers who want green cars, this company is making green cars for the consumer. <clears throat> The for whom question is about um, sharing the economic pie or redistributing the economic pie. Uh, in a market type system, which of the following best describes how the production of goods and services are decided? Okay, so here, um, how the production of goods and services is decided. So do consumers, uh, do we have a say in how uh, McDonald's produces their hamburgers? Not really. Um, the So the answer here to this question is B. So the actual decisions regarding the production methods are to be, you know, the firms make those decisions themselves, the private firms, not the government. And and there's an incentive for them to be efficient at it. Um, D is the answer if this question was the what to produce. So the what to produce question is indirectly answered by consumers through their demand or purchasing behavior. A market system type of economy is one in which most economic decisions are made by consumers and privately owned businesses. No economic decisions are made in a decentralized manner. Private and government decision makers have an equal influence on economic decisions or the dominant influence is the government. So yeah, clearly that I see a bunch of A's on the screen and you guys are right. Yeah. Let's suppose a government makes a decision to increase income taxes on high income Canadians and reduce it for low income Canadians and then increase the financial support for unemployed Canadians. What of the three questions does this relate to? Is this talking anything about uh, how we should use our, what goods and services we should produce from our scarce resources? Nope. Is this at all talking about how to produce? So the decision of the private firms uh, on how to produce a particular good? No. So which one must it be? Yeah, it must be C. So here, again, we're, if you think back to my example of the deserted island, we make our, our shelter, we make, we, we have food. We The for whom question is how do we divide this up? You know, who gets what? And the economic pie is what we produced, our, our, our huts and shelter and and food and so we're talking about dividing it up so this question here is basically saying we're you know we're going to take basically going to sort of redistribute the economic pie among people so this is related closest to the for whom to produce decision okay so um, make sure you read chapter one in the textbook here are some suggested end of problem questions and make sure you get registered in connect and do your pre-class quiz for next week all right that concludes our lecture for today i'll open it up to see if there's any questions Okay, uh, great. If there are any questions, you can always uh, send me an email. So thank you for listening and we will see you next week. Take care and have a good night. Oh yeah, I noticed the question. Yes, all of the lecture slides, in case you've joined late, all of the lecture slides are posted on Slate. You'll find them all there. They're already there now. Okay, great. Thanks again and have a good day.